At Tuplux, uh, we help companies build and design their digital products across AI, mobile, and web. Um, it's hard not to notice uh, that AI is advancing really fast, and, uh, and a lot of that innovation is, is powered by research. We have been investing in AI and research since 2015. Our team has been uh, publishing research papers um, at worldwide conferences and working on AI solutions for startups and enterprises across many industries. And that gave us a lot of exposure to both worlds, the academia and the industry. And in many cases, those two worlds are working in tandem. At the same time, perception of AI has shifted from being overhyped password to delivering business value first. It's especially important now in the coronavirus era as companies and investors shift from growth to profitability. So we thought it would be a good idea to have a conversation about how to turn research into business solutions and give you a better understanding how academia and business work together. We've got a great panelist today, and I hope you'll enjoy the discussion. With that, I'd like to invite Tomasz Szczynski, our chief scientist and partner at Tuplux, to the stage to host the panel. Tomasz, uh, our virtual stage is all yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Pavel, for the uh, invitation to the stage, and thanks for the intro. Um, it's going to be an amazing panel. Uh, I'm sure that you're going to enjoy it. We're going to talk all uh, interesting facts and uh, all dirt and, and all uh, crazy things that happen in research and how it, uh, it's turned into production, um, both in academia and in industry. Um, I think it's, uh, it's going to be quite uh, well, exciting to, to share a different perspectives. We have excellent set of um, members and excellent set of guests and that will take part in this panel. Um, and I, I'd love to invite now uh, all the panelists. Um, I'll try to give a short introduction uh, about uh, all of uh, the panelists that will we'll speak today. We will have um, Vincent Lepetit from University of Bordeaux, my uh, PhD advisor and, uh, and a good friend, um, Alexander Howinski from University of Washington, um, who's uh, working also in computer vision and machine learning as well as computer graphics. Uh, we have Kwang Mu Yi from University of Victoria, um, as well as uh, Lukasz Pijinski from Stanford uh, University. Uh, and finally, uh, last but not least, uh, Krzysztof Geras, uh, a professor at NYU School of Medicine, uh, who's also uh, we're very well experienced with uh, both uh, data science, machine learning, and healthcare and medicine. Thank you for joining the panel, and I'm uh, excited to uh, have you all here together with uh, with me in this remote uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic world. Uh, but it's it's great to see you all. So um, maybe let's start uh, our panel with the first question that uh, I have on my list, uh, which I hope is going to uh, introduce some kind of uh, interesting discussion or, or even a quarrel. So innovation has originally come from many places. Um, nowadays, we see both academia and industry uh, to be adapting methods that are, uh, you know, machine learning driven. Uh, they have AI as part of, of their um, core competences. Is it, according to you, uh, academia that uh, sources that gives the, the source to new methods that may be later adapted in the industry? Or is it rather the industry that drives the generation of new algorithms, new needs, new applications, um, and so on? And uh, I would like to ask perhaps Vincent first, what is your opinion on that? What, what do you think? Uof. Uh, <laughs> uh, I guess so. Uh, that's a uh, that's a little bit of both. Uh, but uh, to give uh, to give more details, um, the so these days though there are a lot of research uh, already in companies, and uh, so that it's not just now actually. So that so there was a lot of uh, industrial uh, labs uh, before the new era of. Uh, 
deep learning and uh, AI, so that's not necessarily a new phenomenon. Uh, what is in interesting, with, what is important and possible with academia is that you can do research on the very long term, uh, so that uh, you can take your time, you can really develop a new, uh, uh, new stuff, and not just uh, get the low uh, hanging, uh, hanging fruit, uh, which is sometimes the case in, uh, in, the, in, uh, in the industry. Uh, but uh, so that's true that um, in computer science in general and probably uh, AI, so there is a lot of cl oh, uh, clear applications, or at least it's something which is very applied. So that's or close to application, much more closer than compared to uh, uh, to other fields. And so that's. Uh, uh, that's easier to make the transfer between academia and uh, and the industry and uh, also the researchers you know uh, we also like money uh, like money so that's if we can see that there is an opportunity to <laughs> uh, to create a startup and uh, maybe we'll uh, we'll work on a specific direction if we think it's promising for a product uh, so that's uh, um, I guess that's part of the <laughs> of the phenomenon so these days. Uh, yeah, so that's there is also a, a lot of very, very excellent research in uh, in the industry uh, for sure. So that's uh, uh, but it's um, you know uh, the there are research labs in the industry from Google, Facebook. It's but it's mostly uh, also mostly for show. Uh, my experience is that many of these big companies there is relatively little transfer between uh, the research labs in big companies and act actual products actually. So there is a there is a set also a set of engineers who are actually doing the work, maybe the they are uh, doing the transfer between the, the product and that also the, the research labs. Thank you so much. Um, Alex, what what do you think? You have worked previously at uh, both uh, Facebook, uh, Google, you've seen it from from the kitchen, uh, you're also active in, in academia. Where do you think the innovation starts? Is it academia or is it is it industry? I think it's a cycle, right? You know, you 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 have some cool research, which is, I don't know, ten years out, and you and you work on this kind of big picture idea. Uh, that idea, somebody sees it in in industry. They have a big team of people. They'll work on that idea. They'll really polish it to the point that it's you know something that's usable by people. Uh, they'll pare down all those little kind of research ideas, which may have been useful, may have been interesting, but at the end product don't make that big of a difference. They'll kind of pare it down to something which is, you know, as sharp as possible, goes to the end as possible to something that's usable. And then I think eventually kind of at the end of the cycle that makes its way back to academia and not so much as another research project, but it then becomes a tool that people can use to do research for new things. So it kind of like opens up you know, new fields opens up new ideas because it then becomes just another thing that you can use. So I think a good example for this would be like, I don't know, uh, the 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 depth camera. So you have these like, you know, cameras that scan your faces on your phones. These were research projects like not too long ago and, and pretty much only in academia. And this found its way all the way to industry. They found a way to, to productize this. They found a way to, you know, turn this into something that was useful. And then as a result, it's kind of found its way back into academia and it's become you know, a million times more uh, to, uh, uh, popular because people now can use it for you know, anything and everyone has one already. So it kind of makes things a lot easier. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, Wukash, you've uh, been working in the, uh, the intersection of uh, healthcare medicine, machine learning at one of the most prominent institutions, uh, Stanford University. How does it look from from your perspective? Is it Stanford that gives you know feeds all the ideas to the Google and, and Apple folks in the neighborhood, or is it the other way around? What do you think? Yeah, I definitely agree. It's a kind of a cycle. Uh, it's a cycle where the uh, end user is very often has to be involved to have anything reasonable out of it. So the way it works is Stanford. Like there are many uh, scenarios at Stanford where it works well. But one good example is uh, the bio design program at Stanford, where they basically bring people from engineering, from healthcare, uh, healthcare professionals, uh, business people into one cohort to study 
and methods of deploying medical devices or medical solutions in a hospital. But the way it works is that they spend half a year in a hospital. They look for needs in the hospital. They interview doctors, they interview uh, users of technologies. So for example, when they want to come up with a new prosthesis, it's not that, uh, hey, there are all those great solutions, right? There uh, that we want to tap into from academic world. Instead, we just go to the user and figure out that the very basic problems are actually the problems so that they cannot really stand up with a prosthesis. So we focus on how to walk fast, faster, but like in the end, it's standing up is a problem or um, uh, very like basic uh, user experience problems like uh, that those prostheses don't look well enough for them to feel comfortable outside. And then we think, how to solve problems that are actually problems, not how to, how to solve problems that uh, are just exciting from the academic perspective. But having said that, like there are many people who just focus on um, like totally academic problems, and that's also great. It's just uh, good to distinguish uh, problem solving from just uh, coming up with academic problems to solve. Thanks so much, um, Christoph. Uh, you're sitting in uh, pandemic New York. I hope it's, it's getting better now. Uh, you're actually an assistant professor in the uh, School of Medicine, which gives you, <clears throat> I guess, a unique opportunity to see how the problems that we were solving as part of academy, uh, academic uh, community and machine learning are coming into real life, like with you know real problems, uh, uh, patients, uh, doctors. Uh, what, what do you think uh, is the case uh, for sourcing the ideas, is it the medicine, or is it, the, or, or uh, you know, research uh, in, in medicine, or is it research in academia that stems that? Yes, I think you you touched a lot of interesting questions. Uh, yeah, so I think first of all, I, I think an answer to your question really depends on what kind of innovation you are thinking about, right? So. Uh, I think the industry will never really be that interested in doing innovation in mathematics or uh, particle physics because there is not very much you know American dollars you can make <laughs> you can make there um, and uh, you, you know and so I think right now if we are talking about let's say broadly understood AI uh, it has you know AI has become uh, in a way so democratic that you don't anymore you don't need an academic title anymore or even an academic position uh, to do research in AI uh, there are you know even outside of uh, outside of academia and outside of industry there's also a large community which you know so maybe we would call it hobbyists right <laughs> that people who are who are neither affiliated they don't have any affiliate let's say academic affiliation uh, maybe you know or and or don't work in the industry maybe they are just students or uh, you know or uh, or people who do things in their free time that actually do amazing things right so it's uh i think right now everybody is really uh capable of innovating in in ai and it's amazing i, I think this is really great uh i i think also we have to also consider this question uh in in time i think you know in let's say in our in our let's say capitalist economy uh there are different cycles right and uh right at least until very recently we we're in the cycle where there were lots of big, com big companies who had lots of cash and they were looking for some creative ways of spending it uh that would maybe bring them more money right like right, right now we are probably finishing finishing the cycle but at the top of the cycle, uh, a lot of industries, a lot of industries were were hoping that they will create some innovation that will, you know, maybe allow them to create better products. But you know, when you know, but when there isn't very much money in the, in the industry, then academia is more important because they have a, you know, they have a, they have access to sources of money from governmental sources of money that is, you know, that don't dry, dry, they don't dry, they get dry so easily. Um, so I think that's so that's I think something we have to you know take into account in this conversation. And uh, if we talk about specifically about uh, research in medicine, uh, I I think there is a I think there is a I think specifically in medicine there is a different type of research that can be done in an academic setting and an industry setting. Um, the the thing about medical research is often that it's extremely expensive. 
uh, especially if you think about you know clinical trials right like this this thing you know or, or if you want to do like if you want to create a new antibiotic right it's it's impossible to do this kind of a thing in at the university right because the cost of this is you know once the cost of once the cost of creating some technology is uh, you know with more than a few million dollars then university it will either not be able to do it or will or will be very slow in doing it because it will you know require creating some huge consortium which will be very slow etc so uh, i think the most i think the most innovative ideas uh, in medicine including ai in medicine come from the university but uh, after this initial incubation period to really scale them up to you know to actually make something very often uh, to you know to really scale them up to be really applicable for uh, for you know for everybody then then it has to be done it has to be done by at least some combination of industry and academia yeah this is where where the money is so yeah. money is required for, for those kind of uh, scaling. So maybe let, let, let me uh, tweak a little bit the question mm -hmm. for, for Kwang, who is uh, uh, assistant professor at the University of Victoria and uh, also ex-EPFL uh, uh, postdoc. Uh, you've seen a lot of this uh, things happening both in academia in the recent years and industry, the papers that are being published. Even at Tuplux, we have, uh, you, you're part of an uh, advisory, research advisory board where we publish papers. Uh, so it's not only academia where uh, the research is, uh, is done. The papers are being published by people without titles. Uh, as uh, Krzysztof mentioned, uh, there are a lot of hobbyists uh, out there. Don't you think that the, the whole system, like academic system, is a bit outdated uh, right now? What is your opinion about that, Wong? So, well, I, I think I want to first say that um, this question is, uh, I think we can't have a single answer for the entire AI, so-called, because it will be quite field dependent. For example, um, the things that I do typically are like learning local features and solving things related to autonomous driving quite a lot but then in those cases the gap between the idea and the uh, prototype and the product is very very uh, narrow compared to uh, like for example medicine so i can give you an anecdote that uh, for example um, our biggest rival in terms of what we were developing was magic leap and of course that's a company with an industry uh, uh, that has a lot of research power and, um, well, uh, until a few weeks ago, uh, had a lot of research power and then uh, was really chasing us and then they actually beat us at the end. So uh, I think it's really fuel dependent and the distinction between industry and academia is a little bit more bland in our case where we are really researching things quite tied to practical applications. And in those cases, perhaps um, the uh, hot, so-called hobbies have also um, less of a hurdle to get into the thing. But um, whenever I uh, see this question, like, is your PhD degree now not really meaningful? I tend to sort of disagree because I am in academia and I am making a living out of it. But, <laughs> and another thing is that uh, regardless of whether you have a PhD or a degree or an education or not, there has to be some kind of training to lift you up, up onto the level where you're doing uh, research that could convince other people. So although it might seem outdated, it's more like it's happening all over the world. And maybe we might need to rethink how um, these degrees are ordered and everything, but I don't think it's too much outdated because another thing that I want to emphasize is um, rare events are the interesting ones. And that's why we're seeing and hearing about these. And majority of these papers are still from academia or maybe people having degrees um, that were awarded from academic institutions. Thank you for, for, for I, I personally have seen uh, the change uh, between, uh, you know, the way that the venues, the conferences were organized a couple of years ago, where it was, you know, purely academic. Uh, the anecdote that I always uh, tell is about 
uh, NIPS at that time, not even NeurIPS in, in 2012, where Google had a, a single table with a few leaflets. Uh, and there were like two scared uh, guys on the other side of the table asking passage, uh, passerbys if they would like to work for Google. Now it's actually uh, last, well, two years ago, uh, the exhibition hall for, for commercial uh, partners uh, was so big that they had to break uh, the, the poster session into two floors so that they could fit enough, um, you know, uh, exhibition uh, stands for, 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 for industry. Um, but coming from, from this angle, uh, how uh, academia evolved and how industry evolved, um, Alex, uh, you're still um, working on towards your, your, your PhD. Um, how, how do you see this, this being valued in the world of, of industry? Like, do you expect to be more um, valuable as, a, as an employee uh, after earning your degree, not only, uh, you know, financially, but also in terms of the career opportunities and so on? Or is it just uh, something as a certificate on Coursera that you will display to, to, to uh, prove to yourself that, uh, that you're fit to the job and, and then move forward? What is your opinion about that? I'm I think that's, that's almost a mean question, you know? I think, I think, uh, <laughs> well, so, uh, I don't think it necessarily makes me uh, more intrinsically valuable as an employee in, in industry, but actually, before I get into that, I want to kind of add a couple points to, to, you know, the last discussion, which is, you know, papers in industry and papers in, in academia. And I think it's a good point that, you know, uh, you know, papers, papers have been starting to come out more and more from, from industry, but I don't think that, you know, having a PhD necessarily, uh, so it, it's, it's, it's a measurement of, of the fact that you've completed a degree, a degree and you've learned, say the necessary skills to perform research. It's kind of like a, a cert certificate that tells you, tells other people that you've, you've managed to learn these things. But I think, you know, as with with anything else, as with say like simple maths, right? You know, you you have a, a degree from elementary school, and that tells you that that you should know simple maths, right? But there are people who didn't go to elementary school who do know simple maths, and they do it quite well, right? There are a lot of people with just natural talent. So I think that there's a lot of papers coming from 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 industry. Um, which sure, I think probably the vast majority of them have some involvement from somebody who who did get an academic academic degree, but I think still um, I I don't think it invalidates any of that research. Uh, but there there is one point uh, which I do want to make, which is kind of a conversation that if you talk to conference organizers, at least in in you know vision or graphics, any time in the past five years, they're all kind of talking about, and that is there's this kind of like divide that started uh, between uh, industry papers and academic papers in conferences. So like as a reviewer, you'll receive, uh, you know, I don't know, five papers, 10 papers, I don't know, 20 papers, which is what it's becoming nowadays. But uh, when you receive these papers, like half of them are going to be these papers, which look super polished. They look like almost products that you know, somebody's put together at a company. And that's because there's like 30, 40 people putting, you know, six months into these papers. And then the other half of the papers are like, you know, clearly some students who spent, you know, a year of their life toiling away, trying to put together something that would only barely make it into the conference, right? So it's like, you know, as a reviewer, when you're seeing these two things at the same time, it's very hard to be, you know, totally rational and say, well, you know, they, they worked hard and this is good research and so on. So uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, in the in the community or at least people who've been organizing conferences have been talking about, you know, kind of whether it sh there should be an artificial separation of these two things, you know, whether whether there should be kind of an academic track and an, an industrial track or something like that. So that because, I mean, you know, you do want these student papers to, to get in. You do want to acknowledge when good research has been done, even if it isn't like super polished, right? But at the same time, 
you don't want to hinder the progress of research in, in industry either, right? Like a lot of this other stuff is also valid research. So um, yeah, no, it's a, good, it's a good question and I don't have the answer to it, but, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting topic to discuss. Thank you, thank you so much. No, I'm, I wasn't, uh, you know, meant to be mean. No, no question about that, but it seems that you have some uh, deep uh, analysis on on the papers and the reviewing process uh, being done in the, in the past. Um, what I wanted to maybe turn this a little bit um, over into, as the title of this panel is uh, turning AI, turning research papers uh, into production, into business solutions. Uh, maybe let's start with some, um, you know, funny or unexpected, uh, unexpected turn of uh, events when it comes to um, taking academic folks, people who have uh, seen their uh, lives being eaten by those years of, of publishing and writing papers, uh, what happens when you take them out of their roots and put them into in, into industry? Any cases where you know that that was uh, funny or uh, there was a clear error? Uh, Ukash is um, uh, on top of being an excellent researcher uh, and and uh, you know working at at Stanford, uh, he's also co-founded several uh, startups, um, including Deep uh, Art uh, IO, the uh, famously style transferring. Uh, uh, images uh, on the web. You've seen uh, a lot of commercial validation of uh, research ideas. Have you seen any any big failures or any um, you know um, booms uh, of of, uh, of research being turned into production? So I think most of the ideas that come from academia and are, we try to commercialize them will be failures. Like most of the ideas that you just take to the market will market will show you that it's a failure for lots of different reasons. So uh, for deep art, it's hard to talk about that as a failure. Like we just got a lot of interest and it was a big splash all over the world. So there was a lot of attention and that's like just our expectations were very high and uh, the market just showed to where those expectations should be. Like it's a good way to get a lot of interest. It's a good way uh, to excite people and for two days or three days and like it's everyone likes those gimmicky apps built by ai where you can turn your face into like a dinosaur or a, a giraffe or whatever and then after two days you just don't like this giraffe anymore and you turn into an, another app so for people working on this gimmicky app it's two years of work but for a person just playing with that it's two days of fun at most um so that's that's definitely um that's definitely a problem, but like that's that's on the gadget side. Like that, that's that's not. I wouldn't say that that represents how academia works. Like no, on the other side of the spectrum is are things that I'm working on right now, where we build solutions for clinical research and contract research organizations, where they um, just want to find um, lesions in a CT scan of brain or like a cancer in lungs or things like this. Uh, there the need is real and uh, you can save lives and there's a lot of money involved but then again a lot of new problems come in so you you again have your solution that you've been working on for a year and then uh, the market will show if there, there is first there's a need of, for that are you big enough to convince anyone to use it you're going into sales cycles in medicine in healthcare that are one to five years long and like a lot of problems uh different than in deep art but still problems that can crush your, your idea. So I think whenever you try to bring anything from academia, you need to realize that your idea is a tiny bit of what is actually going to happen uh, in, the, in the next months of, or, or years where market is validating what you're doing. Yeah, I fully agree with that. At uh, Tuplux, we've been serving uh, software services for startups all over the world, both from uh, academic background and, and technological background. and. Uh, market is the ultimate judge for pretty much every single business idea. So maybe um, since there are a few questions, some of them are really uh, highly upvoted in this tool. Uh, maybe I can switch to those now. Um, so a question that we have from the audience is, what is the best way for a prospective founder to partner with a professor, scientist or researcher if there is alignment in interest? So what are the, the ways that you see uh, in your um, well area of expertise that, that a partner, uh, a founder from, from a startup can, can partner with you to work on the ideas that uh, uh, 
and that is interesting. Vincent, uh, how, how does it work in your uh, uh, area of, of expertise? Uh, what, what do you think is the best way for a, a startup founder uh, to partner with, with, with you? <laughs> I think I think you can uh, you can contact people directly because we are pretty open actually. Uh, if you have something interesting, it's just that you have to make sure that you, und you that you understand what the person works on. So that if it's really a good fit, because if you didn't do your uh, homework uh, and we feel that you don't really understand what we are what we are doing. I'm well, not necessarily going to like it, but uh, uh, if it's an idea that we feel that it's interesting and uh, very close to our own interest, I think you can go for it. And uh, of course, then you can. You, you need to make sure that the person is really interested and is going to have time to work on your uh, or with you on uh, on your problem because we are also pretty busy. But uh, but um, yeah, so I think uh, we are open. And uh, if uh, if you contact us with a good idea that <laughs> matches our interest, uh, I think that can work relatively easily, actually. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, the second question uh, is about comparison uh, between the environments for uh, AI computer vision research between the US and the others. Uh, and uh, I, I, I believe uh, Krzysztof, uh, has uh, quite a bit of a uh, research uh, expertise in, in, in both of those continents. Uh, uh, he was uh, working on his PhD in Edinburgh, uh, working in, uh, in New York right now. Um, what, what, what are the main differences uh, in the environment for mm -hmm. us in, uh, in UK, Europe? Uh, uh, I think, you know, so it's, uh, I think they're quite similar. Uh, I think, you know, I don't, so, I mean, US and the UK, I think are probably, if you compare the US to, you know, to the rest of Europe or to Asia, I think probably the US and the UK are the most similar. Um, I think that kind of a difference between, um, between them is that uh, the research groups in the UK typically tend to be smaller. Uh, so, you, you know, it's, it's typically just maybe a like the, the professor or the group leader and uh, you know maybe like three or four students um, and they tend to work on uh, they tend to work on problems that are maybe a little bit closer to theory uh, often uh, because you know just it's kind of an environment that is that can be better done in, in a you know, this kind of work, the kind of work that's more related to theory can be done better in smaller groups. Um, I I think you know the, the kind of the American groups tend to be tend to be much bigger. The PhDs are longer as well uh, in U, in the U.S. in comparison to in comparison to uh, to the U.K. So they can they can attack bigger problems. Uh, potentially also with uh, stronger application, the stronger application side, because they, you know, they have the resources to do it. Um, I think the, you know, the, I think the other differences just come from the differences in the, you know, funding agencies in the UK and the US. So it's a, uh, the, 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 the funding agency in the US are, and agencies in the US are generally, uh, are generally, you know, they generally give much more money to the, to the researchers. Uh, so it's a, uh, and you know they're willing to take more. Also, the I think the 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 groups in the U.S. are willing to take more more risk because of that. Just because they, you know, because they can, they don't have because they have more money. They don't have to necessarily always be worried about every penny. Got it. So maybe the quant can also give us a perspective mm -hmm. of uh, differences between uh, U.S. or actually Canada. Uh, uh, Europe, where you you were doing your postdoc, and Asia, uh, where you did your PhD. What what are those differences? You have probably the broadest uh, broad view on, on those. Uh, what what is your opinion? Yeah, I, I felt like this question um, would come to me because I uh, the question actually asked for North America, Europe, and Asia, and I I've been there all three. Um, so I can't say for US because I I haven't been there, but. Uh, with regards to Canada and Europe, I think um, there are some similarities. The Canadian system is a little bit like everybody gets a small share system. 
Um, so uh, you do have um, a single uh, grant that allows you to survive, which probably is why deep learning uh, survived in Canada, actually, because you have this long uh, strain of grants that allow you to do whatever you want. But then the groups aren't as big as in the US because the grants are also small. Um, and in case of the South Korea, I can't say for all Asia, but for South Korea, uh, research is a little bit more uh, leaning towards the practical side. For example, uh, a lot of the money uh, now comes from the government because they're just uh, giving out money right now. But um, many of these research projects will involve big companies like Samsung, and they tend to uh, actually uh, ask for deliverables, which are a little bit um, uh, something that like some code, perhaps something more close to a product cycle, like a six months and in the down the road, you will become an actual product, for example. So I think those are some of the different atmospheres there. So um, uh, academic institutions in South Korea actually uh, do a lot of uh, research that the industry partners would like them to do. Yeah. Thank you so much. The, the next question, and I encourage the audience to actually ask even more. I'll try to go through as many as possible within the time limit. Uh, the next question uh, goes to Alex, uh, which is what can a founder bring to academia that you're lacking? If you think about you know, a startup founder, is there anything that uh, he can or she can bring to to, to academia to the way that, that you work at the, at the university that uh, that you're missing what, what do you think what's your opinion so i'm assuming here by founder we're talking about like a startup founder somebody who's business savvy uh, you know i i think I've, I've been involved with kind of advising for a few startups in the past and i think i've had you know i've had pretty mixed experiences in general uh dealing with people who are on the business side of things you know and i think it's this is kind of common for a lot of people who are very deep in in academia because you know if you spend all day kind of like totally focused on your you know research or solving some very deeply technical thing kind of being having the ability to step back and kind of explain this from you know a very you know big picture or to a third grader or something like that it's it's difficult right you know so a lot of these kind of conversations that you would have uh, with with business people are sometimes they feel they feel a bit forced they feel uh, they feel a bit difficult and I think it's a special skill there's like a special set of people who are very good at this they're very good at kind of straddling that divide between you know cultures between conversations between the people who are you know they're 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 very good that their jobs entail kind of social interactions and money and dealing with people and people who their jobs entail you know very little social interaction if i'm being honest and sitting at your computer and doing a lot of thinking right so um i think i think that that the, the people who can you know make that connection that can kind of take an idea understand the technical uh, depth and also uh, understand the business side of things that connection is probably the the, the one that's missing the most uh, when you look at kind of you know uh, research projects which want to make it in into into the business world thanks so much uh, now this is absolutely true uh, also at, at Tuplux where we meet a lot of founders and a lot of people who are trying to become founders or trying to uh, get their startups up and running uh, this this mix of, of competences between uh, you know technical understanding and business understanding is very helpful also for us to help the the, the startups and bring, really bring the value to, to the customers um so the next question is uh well related to epfl actually uh some of you folks uh, have actually worked or, or touched epfl in one way or the other um so maybe I, i'll try to point that uh um, Vincent, uh, who probably was the first one of all of us uh, out there. Uh, the question is uh, the following. Uh, can you comment a little bit about the Swiss startup scene? Uh, I have a feeling uh, that many researchers there start local specialized companies rather than joining Google or Apple in Zurich. Uh, what, is, what is your opinion um, 
about this uh, ecosystem. You can you can send the oldest one, and that's okay, and that's true. So that I can accept that. Uh, but uh, uh, actually, I think it's uh, there. Are, I had PhD students uh, at EPFL. Uh, who went to uh, companies like Google or Apple. So there is also Microsoft, NVIDIA, so that's very attractive. And they are all in Zurich, that's true. Uh, and actually, they do, or some of them still do uh, pretty good uh, pretty good research. So that's also a, a good opportunity to, uh, to stay in Switzerland and uh, because it's also an attractive place. Uh, and to still have a, a good uh, a good job, but also it's true that there is uh, a lot of uh, people uh, happy to give you money uh, uh, in Switzerland. So not, I don't really know Zurich, but uh, Lausanne, where there is a EPFL, it's close to Geneva, and you have a lot of people who, who are rich and uh, uh, can uh, are also can that's easy to also they are also actively looking for uh, people who want to develop a comp uh, with good ideas and i also had colleagues uh, for that at epfl there is a big or oh, yeah pretty large part of uh, the campus world which are which is dedicated to uh, companies and uh, or startup uh, uh, to uh, to develop so there is there is a lot of possibilities and uh, helps from uh, from EPFL to develop a startup. So that's uh, I know both uh, people. Uh, yeah, that's uh, people who went to companies and people who uh, started their com their own companies on the startup of uh, the campus of EPFL, and now they are actually pretty successful. So that's uh, um, yeah. Thank you. That's, that's the two uh, two options. Thank you for, for, for that. Um, I, I hope it answers the questions from the audience. Uh, the, the next one that is uh, maybe looking a bit more on, on how to turn uh, research into, into business solutions as, as the title of this panel. Uh, what is the best way to implement a research paper algorithm or a model for a small scale university project, probably also a business uh, idea? What will be the steps involved in converting those lines? Uh, Wukash, I think you had uh, previously uh, done some of those uh, works before uh, and you have co-founded uh, uh, you know exciting interesting startups that are hopefully going to rock the, the world soon what is your uh, you know take on that how to do it how to turn research into um, you know research model research paper into into code so i think i will repeat myself a little bit but basically the market will be your main problem so um Testing your solution as quickly as you can with the against the market is probably a, a good idea. So just implement as scratchy version uh, as possible of whatever you want to implement, or you not even you don't even have to implement. Just go to your users and ask if they're or show them some prototype or show them uh, the idea. Just let them imagine how the world would, would look like with your solution and just test if they're willing to pay for that. What would they change? What uh, find all the obstacles and try to just solve them one by one because the main problems will won't be on the research side most likely so there's a lot a lot of code written already there's a lot of stuff um, being done all the frameworks like pytorch allow you to build the actual prototype of your solution over a weekend so those this won't be a problem the problem will be that no one will want to pay for that or uh, that uh, they don't have infrastructure in a company to actually deploy your product or that the sales cycles take five years uh, or that the target customers that you're approaching are just not working with startups like there, there are lots of random problems that you'll figure out uh, depending on where you're trying to uh, go so um and yeah i i would basically start with investigating like listing all the problems to solve rather other than uh, the actual um, implementation of the research paper and uh, trying to find ways to solve those problems and test your solutions against those problems without with, with writing as little as possible. I think this is a very, very good tip. And I've, I've heard it from, from many, uh, many places, which is uh, focus on problem and, and not on the technology. Uh, that's uh, something as engineers is very difficult for us to uh, to consume. Um, so maybe then uh, let's move uh, to the other uh, question that we have on, on, on board. Uh, Krzysztof, you have seen a uh, grant uh, acquisition systems uh, both in Europe and in the US. 
do you think that uh, the grant acquisition system is compatible in terms of the speed of how, how fast you can get grants uh, to how fast AI uh, develops today with uh, you know increasing number of papers? Uh, what do you think? Um, I think actually a grant acquisition system isn't as slow as uh, one might think. Uh, you know, so if I if I had a lot of uh, energy, that's because that's my main bottleneck. Right? If I have a lot of energy and a lot of and a lot of great ideas, then you know, just you know, and if I could if I could just spend maybe like three months at home writing grants, yeah, you know, nine months later I would have five million dollars, you know, so or, or more. So it's a you know, so it's pretty. So I think it's uh, I think the cycle is relatively fast, you know. So even if you, and, and you know, in everybody in academia, let's say typically has some kind of a buffer that you know maybe if they want to develop something in one year, they would they would maybe start searching for a PhD student or a postdoc and and be able to hire them relatively quickly to, and then you know scale up if the initial initial thing is successful. Uh, I think there's, you know, so I, I don't think there is really a problem there. I think the problem is, uh, you know, I think the problem is more in the scarcity of funds, right? And that in practice, you, you know, in practice, you, you know, in practice, you don't have infinite energy that you can apply to, you know, to like to writing grants for a few months, only, right? Uh, but I think industry also has this, industry also has some delay there. So, because, uh, you know, you also have to, it also takes some time to in a, in a in a company to convince someone to to give you the money anyway so i mm -hmm. i don't think that's i don't think that's very much of a problem uh at least not i think not in the american uh grant system and you know and there are so many there are so many uh private foundations that can give you money relatively quickly there are you know especially right now there are so many company grants that you know that you can get quickly uh you know there are you know there are many possibilities to directly work with industry outside of these uh schemes uh yeah. that i think I, I don't think this is i don't think this is the limitation that uh academic researchers really have thank you thank you so much alex yeah i, I want to ask how about how about the speed of um a publication, the kind of the, the pace of of conferences, does that match the pace of, of, of research in your field? Kind of, you know, I mean, in, in for instance, like uh, in a lot of vision and, and, and AI, you know, machine learning conferences now, people are starting to complain about, you know, uh, the fact that this, you know, the, the conference yeah. system just, just doesn't work quite as well anymore, right? Like, you know, the, the cadence doesn't work with the pace of research. Mm -hmm. uh, is that also true yeah, so for other fields? So I think it's I think you're correct I think you're right that uh, the conference system is you know it's kind of outdated, uh, and it and it was built you know with different I think it will build it was built with different kinds of uh, kind of circumstances in mind, uh, and I think the really you know I think the I think we are all computer scientists, or you know or some sort of computer scientists. Uh, it's a really weird. Thing that we have, like the conference system that we have in computer science, is really strange. It's uh, you know, it's it's practically almost all fields of science have a totally different have a totally different system. They have conferences that have, you know, that, that they have that they have relatively high acceptance rates for speculative ideas, short turnarounds, where you just come and present your idea, maybe have a poster. And then you write a paper into a journal, and that's your let's say that's your scientific contribution. In computer science, we have these kind of conferences where you actually work super hard, get rejected a few times, and then and then eventually you get your paper accepted, and that's your like the, the paper, the conference paper is is kind of what counts towards your you know PhD or tenure. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think this is really strange, and I think it has to it will have to change uh, in time. I, I I think this is I think this is wrong. But uh, I think this. But if you, if I have to, let's say, compare uh, computer science to, you know, to let's say medicine. Like I've been doing some work in, let's say, medical imaging. Uh, their cycle is so they have these kind of small conferences. So they have these. Well, I mean, they're kind of the conferences are big, but the papers that you write, you submit there are small in the sense that you would only maybe write two pages, and 
uh, typically there's no formal proceedings. You just give a talk, show a poster, that's it, and you write the paper for the journal. Uh, so the conference part is typically much faster than in computer science. The journal part is often incredibly slow. And, uh, and medicine hasn't really embraced uh, archive or, you know, so they, they still, you know, so they very often they, you know, even if they saw some amazing paper, they would cite, they wouldn't cite it because it's an archive, it's not in the, in the journal. Uh, and they're really biased towards, and they really, they're really biased towards evaluating uh, the value of a paper uh, based on what journal it is in. Um, Mm -hmm. So, so, so this is this is definitely something that was bothering me, and that's kind of how I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to myself, uh, let's say, uh, change this. And I, when I write papers, I put them on archive immediately, uh, and I try to make my code as well uh, uh, available online. And, and I think this is actually, I think this is actually paying off. I think uh, a lot of, I think a lot of people in medicine and medical imaging are actually, you know, actually recognizing that uh, you know this kind of let's say transplanting these kind of ideas of openness of the research from computer science into into, into medicine is the right idea we, uh, we, we, we still have a few <clears throat> more questions uh, some of them related to medical imaging so uh, we have uh, around a couple minutes left uh, I try to ask one more from the audience and then maybe closing around with uh, with with the question uh, about the future of, of how you know a research ideas will turn into production what future uh, what ideas that you've seen around would turn into production um, uh, so uh, for 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 Quan maybe maybe this question that that we received from the audience, uh, did you experience a, a lack of knowledge in, in, you know, machine learning AI from business people in the industry? Like, was there any specific, you know, anecdote where uh, you'd said something or you were discussing something and business people showed up out of nowhere and asked uh, questions? Um, what, 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 what do you think? What, what were your experiences with this? So I, I don't exactly have a definite anecdote, but I, I um, I think it's not only uh, industry or business, it's really uh, people who are due to AI and data science. The uh, one thing that I emphasize as much as possible when teaching and every time when I talk every, anywhere is that you uh, the role of validation and test splits. I've seen so many works and so many instances where there, there is information leakage from training data that goes into catastrophe. So I've seen papers in biomedical domains where there is no uh, validation set, meaning that you just base it to the test set without even knowing it. I've seen instances, uh, I think there was, this was a big buzz in media as well. There was an information leakage on a nature paper and that basically uh, makes the paper invalid as well. And I've, um, and I don't want to name exactly that company, but there was a, a case where a research group in a company uh, got banned from one of the ImageNet challenges for spamming submissions and therefore, um, again, leaking data into whatever model that you choose. And this is something I think um, that we all need to be very aware of, especially perhaps the industry and the business people, because then you get results and numbers that show you incredible results and you test it and deploy it and you get complete, um, um, I, I shouldn't curse here, so a complete bad results, okay? <laughs> so um, sure. yeah, so that's one thing I think um, uh, that people should be aware of, that uh, there are many moving parts in AI and those moving parts should be uh, fixed on a separate set of data that you reserve. And when you want to evaluate the performance of AI, you should never actually have any moving parts move in your system. So that's something that I would like to perhaps take this opportunity to spread a little bit more. Thank you so much. Um, uh, gents, it was a great uh, panel. We had one more uh, last question uh, before uh, kicking off the networking session, which I encourage all of you to attend because we will have opportunity to talk uh, excellent uh, members of the panel uh, in a 
more uh, convenient way, I would say, and ask all the questions that I couldn't ask, unfortunately, uh, over here. Um, so at Tuplus, we're organizing office hours for startup founders, for uh, for people who are running their businesses. Uh, I'll share the link on, on. But these are mostly uh, people who are developing new ideas, new topics, uh, very often turning research uh, or uh, academic ideas into production. Which of the ideas that you've seen in your uh, uh, academic life uh, recently, you believe is going to be a, a killer app? Uh, which one? Which one of those will turn into production in smartphones and everyday life uh, that you probably are working on, maybe, or you've seen in, in the conferences? What are your your thoughts about that? And I'll start with uh, with Alex. Uh, what what do you think is going to come to academia soon? Sorry, I, uh, your voice cut out halfway and I didn't get the, ke the question. Could you repeat? Oh, sorry. sorry. So the question is, what advancements in academia or research that you've seen recently will turn into production and will hit our smartphones uh, soon? Whoa. Well, uh, I think, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of them, right? So um, I can say, for sure, there are things that, that you see now which are popular in universities or popular in conferences, which you just know that you know they're going to show up in the next few years in production. So to like list a few, we could say maybe um, kind of on on chip uh, optimizations for for machine learning. Kind of a lot of the the algorithms that we're seeing right now, you know, for doing really expensive kind of machine learning inference. Uh, those things are happening on really like heavy duty GPUs, but there's been like a lot of, uh, you know, time and, and money put into these startups, which are, are, are optimizing, you know, kind of on device on chip, uh, uh, algorithms for, for machine learning. So that's one thing. I think like a lot of the stuff that you see now, like, you know, super great, uh, uh, you know, detections, object segmentation and so on, uh, you're going to see that on your like smartphone. Uh, camera. Mm -hmm. Very. Thank you. Um, Thank you. One more thing. Got it. Go go. Uh, go ahead. I think I think I think three D is also another big thing, right? Like we we have we have um, kind of like you know we've we've seen teases of this over the past few years. Like you know you've seen your 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 depth camera on 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 the phone, but I think like that's going to take you know big steps in the next few years. I think we're going to be seeing kind of three D scanning. Uh, I think we're going to be see we're, we're going to be seeing the reality, which is kind of AR glasses and and a lot of these types of uh, experiences in in the next few years, very soon. Thank you, uh, Vincent. In a few words, or what what do you think is going to hit the market soon out of academia? Uh, I know, but I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to do a startup with it, and uh, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> So no, so that's true that uh, 3D is uh, is developing quite uh, quite a lot at uh, the computer vision conferences, but to be completely frank, I'm not sure what to do uh, what to do with it. Uh, can you turn already turn it on uh, as a pro as a product uh, for uh, for the general, especially on smartphones? So for the general audience, that's not completely clear. I mean, I saw uh, apps running uh, on uh, smartphones really very well for scanning uh, 3D objects. And uh, I saw plenty of people uh, tw uh, of developing, uh, having very, very nice uh, things, uh, uh, things that were robust and so on, but it never really took off. And uh, that's not completely clear how uh, you can make money out of uh, out of that, and uh, it's a pity because that's actually very very excellent research, really an excellent transfer to the uh, to the devices or so something which is accessible to anybody. And then what do you do with that? So that's uh, that was the maybe you can three uh, D print uh, your child or something or your dog or your cat. Uh, but okay, so that's. Uh, uh, so that's not always clear how you turn very great research and even a great implementation into a product that people are going to uh, are going to use. So maybe the, the transfer is probably much faster from research to relatively specialized markets. So maybe uh, in medical imagery. So that's uh, for example that's more clear. 
but for an app on the smartphones, so for the general audience, that's difficult to really uh, find something that is uh, that is useful. So that's uh, even if yeah, that's things that are very exciting for our researcher, but yeah. Yeah, so actually, Vincent, there is a there's a shop there's a shop in Soho, uh, in on Manhattan in Manhattan where you can actually scan yourself and pretty print yourself already. There's, it's actually it's actually pretty creepy, I think. <laughs> so off to off to you, Christoph. Uh, what is your uh, opinion about the you know ideas turning into production on, on top of the Soho? Oh, uh, <laughs> I think this is, I mean, this is, I think it actually seems very popular and, and these things are quite expensive. So it, you know, I think just to, just to rent this place, it must cost a fortune. Uh, so, so it must be a very successful business. But um, I think I would expect that there's, in terms of, you know, in terms of smartphones, uh, I, I think, and this kind of, this kind of things, I, I expect there's going to be a lot more of these kind of um, self-diagnosis uh, apps. Uh, that I think there's a there's a lot of future there. So for example, uh, and I think there's a beginning. There's already beginning that you maybe you can for example diagnose your maybe your skin if you're, whether you have skin cancer uh, with with a smartphone. Uh, that should work reasonably well if you you know if you make sure that it's all robust to different kinds of uh, you know different domain shifts. Uh, I've seen I've seen apps that. Uh, at least there, people are trying to build apps, for example, to diagnose COVID-19 with your smartphone. You just record what you, you know, so you would like record your brief, uh, how you're breathing, and then it would uh, diagnose you. And I think there's probably a lot more of these kind of opportunities because these, you know, these smartphones have, you know, they, they're beginning to have very good microphones, very, very good cameras. So uh, I think a lot of these kind of things will be developed over the next few years. Thank you. Um... Quank, what is your opinion? How, how does it gonna evolve? So, yeah, I, I also uh, don't have a clear idea because if I were to have a clear idea, I would be rich by now. But um, for one thing that I uh, try to think is how the society is also changing. And one thing that I see uh, right now is that we're going to have a massive spike in terms of bandwidth that a smartphone can have. And I see that as an opportunity to move every computation that's happening in these devices to the cloud, and it will just be a streaming device. And um, that might actually allow us to do more things, like um, more computationally heavy things, actually, that weren't possible on a smartphone. Um, that's, I think, is where things might go. And I also think there must be something better than smartphones. I mean, like, I, we look and type and things, but there must be a way uh, where we could actually do interactions with this device. Uh, we rely a lot on vocal feedback, like the smart home, smart speakers. But something like that um, must happen with these mobile devices as well. Um, I was thinking glasses, but then you know, what happened to Google Glass. So I don't know anymore, but I, I would think something along those lines would be probably the future here. Perfect, thank you. And uh, last but not least, Wukash, and then we will close this up and move to networking session. So Wukash, what, what do you think is gonna happen in the next years? So I have uh, three thoughts on that. So first, I, I want to echo all the previous um, uh, ideas and, and I, especially I am, the, the, the one the closest to me is on healthcare. So I believe there will be more and more um, medical applications like self-diagnosis value-based medicine where uh, you really um, are forced to build solutions such that they give something to a user and to, to, to a patient. Uh, so the companies, like the pharma companies themselves will be pushing to actually building solutions in mobile phones. Apple is in, going into this direction by uh, embedding more and more sensors in their Apple Watch. So I, I, I would expect a lot of things happening there. The other thing I was wondering was that most likely for the next big, big leap in uh, technology and in our smartphones, we shouldn't look for technologies that are state of the art now on, on NeurIPS. Uh, it's something that we, we have all the available tools for building next big things. So when you look at Uber, for example, they build a massive company 
based on just a mobile device and a taxi problem in uh, San Francisco. So they just used uh, technology that was already there. That was it was possible to build that for years. And they then they just connected the dots at some point. It's the same with Airbnb and it's several similar companies. And the third thing I want to mention is that. Uh, Best of, like right now, it's a perfect time for all the uh, entrepreneurs and uh, people who want to become entrepreneurs here in this chat. I believe that it's an excellent time for joining the the space for for two reasons. So, uh, best opportunities come up when there is some qualitative change in the uh, in in the world. So, one big change was the AI uh, revolution. I would say where uh, out of the sudden from uh, this feature based image recognition we switch to something that is completely uh, like that right now someone without medical expertise can build a decent model for medical imaging and and that's that gives a lot of opportunities and a lot of people are, are jumping on that and the other big leap is what is happening with covid so we're right now using a remo app that no one would re really know about if there was no covid and the uh, like the fact that we're moving more towards um those remote solutions. This will, of course, like COVID will be over sooner or later. But uh, right now, we can still develop new solutions that no one has thought about because there's just people didn't have to think about it. Like if you're trying to solve problems that people have been thinking for 50 years, uh, it's more challenging than trying to solve problems that just appeared a week ago and like no one has been thinking about them. So there's so much variance, so much chaos and noise that that's a perfect opportunity to actually join the entrepreneurial space. So uh, I'm, yeah. Uh, Finishing with this positive accent and uh, good luck, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Jens, for all the uh, inputs that you gave into this panel discussion. It was a pleasure to host you all, uh, scientific board members of two books. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad that we managed to uh, all the questions that are coming from the audience and also all the interesting answers that we managed to do. Now, I invite all of you, in, including participants, to now move on to the tables. Uh, you can switch to uh, several tables just to explore, uh, you know, interesting profiles of people who are uh, happily joining this this panel. Maybe exchange some some uh, questions that haven't been asked uh, or ask about uh, other topics. Uh, thank you again. Uh, it was really a great pleasure and uh, well, I hope that turning research papers into business solutions will survive COVID and will definitely, you know, bring more money and more more pro, uh, business to 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 academia and and uh, bring more ideas to academia as well. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of the day and see you at the tables. Thank you.